So what did the British think about the German armed forces, the Wehrmacht, before the war and up to mid-war? So let's take a look at this. So first, the pre-war and the general aspects. It's quite interesting that the British considered the German army as very professional, although they had only minor dealt with it in pre-war aspects and also in early war. So they had major engagements with the Navy and everything, but they looked at the army as the major aspect. And they took a very historical view on this. So there were unification wars, the professionalism there from, from the Danish-German war, the Austro-German war, and of course the Franco-Prussian war of 1870 to 1871. And another aspect was of course the creation of the great general staff, which was a, a, seen as a role model by many European forces. And then they also looked at the breakdown of 1918 when the Germans gave up in the end of the First World War. And for them, that was kind of an assurance that, yeah, this would likely happen again. So they put a lot of effort on looking at the moral of the German population and also of the soldier during the whole war. You can see this in all intelligence assessments and everything around this. Now for the Luftwaffe, there was usually an overestimation of the size. So they usually assumed that they have way more than they actually had, which to a certain degree was due to looking at their own industrial output and thinking that this would be the same for the Germans, which had usually in the early war a limited output. And this is also called mirror imaging in intelligence terms. So basically the analyst thinks that the enemy will think similarly and this was also happened with, with the RAF because they assumed that the Germans would put uh, organize the force and everything similar to their lines. And in some, in some aspects, they were just wrong in this regard. And then they came to different conclusions, different values. And also there was a major aspect of the stereotype of German efficiency. So this is also very interesting that they assumed for quite some time that the early victories of the Germans were due to their proper preparation, not to tactics or doctrine, but to a lot of preparation and in the industrial output actually. They also assumed that the German morale would at one point plummet when there's blockade and the morale would drop due to economic pressure and the hardship of war, which is also quite interesting if one looks at this, which is similar to the aspect that what a lot of times everyone before the Second World War or most assumed about terror bombing and that the morale would go down there. And quite correctly, they were assuming that Germany would go for a short war for a quick victory and they assumed a knockout from the air. Again, this is pre-war, major over-emphasis on, on thinking what air forces, strategic bombers can do which is completely out of touch with what actually happened then. Now to look at something more specific in numbers, let's look at the estimates there were for the German army for September 1938. So basically when the appeasement happened, the Treaty of Munich. So we have three values. Basically we have the war office and the estimate by General Ironside. And then of course there's the German regular numbers. So the war office assumed basically two panzer divisions less than the Germans had, then they didn't account for the four motorized divisions, which were also quite elite units, but they added seven more reserve divisions. Well, Ironside assumed four more panzer divisions, but he also didn't account for the motorized divisions, added 12 reserve divisions and 15 Landwehr divisions, which were basically militia. So in total, the war office assumed about 86 divisions, Ironside 104 and the Germans had around 81 which is pretty spot on. So the order of battle intelligence of the British army was very good. Now, if we look at the air staff intelligence, this is not what we can see. It was off. For 1934, so basically one year before the Luftwaffe was announced officially, I mean, it was already the Shadow Luftwaffe, they assumed that the Germans would have 500 first line aircraft. And then they assumed, here's the mirror imaging, that they would build up these and train them in the upcoming years. So they noted this, this citation, which I put 
somewhere in here, that they wouldn't do window dressing. So that they would be very thorough and really the stereotype, the Germans do everything very thorough. So they build this 500 aircraft and they train everything, every pilot, make everything perfect, and then they build the next 500 aircraft. And as such, they assumed in 1934 that the Luftwaffe would be no match for the RAF before 1945. Now the issue was, Hitler in 1935 claimed they already achieved parity with the Royal Air Force. So, as you can imagine, there was some, some stir-up going on on the British side. And they still were very rigid in everything. They had some good intelligence, but in some cases they disregarded it. And for October 1938, they had a very interesting estimate. They estimated 3,200 aircraft for the German side and 2,400 in reserve. In reality, the Germans had 3,300 aircraft, but zero in reserve. So actually, you could say they actually did window dressing because, as one of my professors put it, they put everything out that they had ahead, the Germans. The British built capacity, they built factories and everything, and the Germans just built aircraft and everything and put everything out there. Fast around it. Exactly the opposite that they assumed originally. Then, very interesting, they estimated that the German and the Italians had long-range bombers which could attack from distance bases against Britain. The thing is, the Germans at this point had the Heinkel 111 which could barely reach England from, at least from German bases, so distant bases in Germany completely off. And so, and this mis overestimation, wrong estimation of German aircraft forces continued well into the Battle of Britain, where basically the British assumed that the Germans could, would have made more aircraft than they actually had. Now let's look at naval intelligence. Basically there were reasonably accurate here. There were just too much submarines assumed because they overestimated the output of the shipyards. And one major problem was they underestimated the combined threat that the submarines in comparison with the surface ships could provide to the British convoys. So they underestimated the Germans there. Now some general aspects for, for the whole assumption is they feared, the British feared a knockout blow of London. So the Luftwaffe was seen always as this major threat and they assumed that I think in one week they could kill about one quarter of a million in the airstrike, which are numbers that are completely off in any regards. And they also assumed that the Germans were unable to survive a long war, which basically, for instance, General Beck completely agreed with, with them, the German general, so, and which also in the long run happened. And so they were, wrong, they were right in this regard. What they were wrong was that the Germans would be unable to tackle the Maginot Line. Of course, you could say, well, the Germans didn't tackle the Maginot Line, they just bypassed it. But, well, if you look at if you look at the, the plan for the first war, which is usually called the Schlieffen plan, which is actually quite incorrect, it should be called the Moltke plan, um, is also, well, why, why attack French defenses if, if there are countries in between which you can just invade? You know, this is first, second war of a German view. Oh, there's a defensive line. There are countries, they provide a direct line into France, why not take those? So anyway, now let's move to the wartime. Now here first some general points from secondary sources and then we will look at some primary sources. So generally it was assumed that the German quality will drop over time. And this is also again the focus very much on the German morale, on the population and on the soldiers. And they noted that the early victories were not due to doctrine or tactics, but very well done German preparation. And this is reflected in 1940, during the Battle of France, they assumed 4,800 German battle tanks. And in total, combined with the other tanks, they assumed about 7,000 to 7,500. The Germans had around half of that, or less than half of that. So basically, there was mainly a parity between the Allied forces and tanks to the German forces. Actually, the Allies had a bit more if you consider the French, the Dutch, and the British forces together, and the Belgian forces, tanks. 
So, and also Churchill in his memoirs still wrote that the Germans had during the Battle of France thousand heavy tanks. I don't know how, but I mean, quite ironically, the Germans in total produced around one thousand Tiger tanks, but they didn't see action before 1942, so I don't know. And it was the first German heavy tank, actually. Unless you consider the Neubau Fahrzeug, but, but it, well, it's debatable if it's a heavy tank and it was also not produced in series. So anyway, they looked at the German efficiency in rearmament. And again, there was this, this stereotype of efficiency. And they assumed there would be a breakdown in 1944, so in around December. So the offensive in the Ardennes, the Battle of the Barge, was quite a shock because at that point they assumed it would break down. And they also assumed there would be a rift between the military and the political side because pre-war there were some issues like the Blomberg fridge crisis, crisis and other aspects which they interpreted wrong. Now let's specifically look at the article German Army in 1939 which was published in the Schoen, in the Rusi Journal which is not like an intelligence assessment, but rather close to it. I think official to semi-official. Rusi, by the way, is still an organization that exists nowadays. So if you're on Twitter, you should follow them. Now, the author assumes that the Germans tripled their divisions from 36 to around 108 for the, for the invasion of Poland. So. The reality was rather close because the Germans had 103 divisions. What other aspects he considered is that due to not having conscription from 1919 to 1934, that there was an overall drop in fighting quality due to a lack in habit in military discipline and everything else. So due to the Treaty of Versailles, which I made the video about, there would be a drop in quality since the habits and everything went down. Well, I think this didn't really turn out. And another <laughs> very interesting aspect he considers that the old class was not there anymore for the officers and everything and they, they decreased or something. And then I have now a lot of officers who were just there for making career money. So in general, he assumed a lack of experienced officers, but noted that Nazi schools could counter this to a certain degree which is not really substantiated. And then it generally talks a lot about Nazification. So for instance, the mass movement and mass enthusiasm, which borders to hysterical and the forced enthusiasm. And he notes this, this almost hysteria will be not very valid in case of a trench warfare, which he assumed would, would happen. So it's more like, okay, these are just hysterical guys screaming around or something and there's no substance to this. It's very interesting if you compare this with the assumption that in 1944 the German army will break down, but this is way more, way, way a stronger disregard of the whole situation. I mean, it, it over-empathizes the, the Nazification aspect, I think, and also disregards the defect to a certain degree what propaganda and everything could have. So, which also is quite interesting because for Poland he notes a costly mass attacks and that there were a lot of losses, if the rumors are believed to be true, he noted. And he notes that the quality of the troops were definitely lower than the First World War, which is quite right, and the German army after the, after the Poland campaign, although it was a major success, had major issues and issued a major retraining program. So in this case, he was quite correct, but the mass attacks with major losses doesn't seem to be substantiated. And probably the most weird part of the whole article is the physical overstrain. He notes strained hearts and flat feet due to too much sports like skiing and other stuff. So, which, I don't know, he refers, to, he refers to newspaper articles from the last two or three years that there were major issues with youth, having weak hearts from too much Hitler youth and, and labor service and something else, and there were breakdowns along those lines. Um, 
Of course, I don't know what was the general medical knowledge back then, so that you can, what, what really happened there. I mean, lately there were some issues in the German current army where they had major, uh, they had some breakdowns during military training. So maybe there was, there were some major issues there that they overtrained certain units and people died or something. But it, it doesn't really substantiate it there. It just says f flat feet and overstrained hearts from too much sports. So this is also noted by another author. It, it sounds quite weird. Now from that weird part, let's move to the more interesting part of organization of an infantry division and some numbers he gave. He noted about 450 machine guns for an infantry division, which is pretty spot on because it was around 516. Note I did a video on 1939 German divisions early on, which with all the numbers. Then he assumed around 54 to 72 anti-tank guns, which is all pretty good because it was around 75. For anti-aircraft, he assumed about 18, but were about only 12, so also quite spot on. Where it was completely off were the mortars. He assumed about 24 was, it was almost 150, so 147. Note that German infantry divisions had quite some disparities in sometimes in the numbers, but these are from the German Military History Research Institute given. So yeah, this should be a good average. So for most part, machine guns a little bit too low, anti-tank guns pretty good on, anti-aircraft gun too much. But more this uh, about fifth, uh, a fifth of that they actually had. He also noted a lack of first grade equipment, quite a lot of, which is also rather valid to a certain degree. The Germans used a lot of uh, captured equipment from Poland, from Austria, and as, of course from Czechoslovakia. Of course, Czechoslovakia had also first grade equipment with the Panzer 38T and also the Panzer 35T to a certain degree. Also, he noted that mass production would lead to low quality. Um, well, you could discuss that aspect. And then he also discussed how much panzer divisions and rapid divisions the Germans had. He assumed five panzer divisions, which is correct if you look at the Polish campaign. I did a video on the panzers in Poland. Yet he assumed for each division 500 panzers. Whereas in reality it was around 320 and later on the Germans realized, okay, these are way too big, so we need to reduce the number of tanks here. And for the rapid divisions, he assumed 250 tanks each. And he assumed four and basically they were three. Now rapid division is, these were basically the Panzer Division Kampf, the Leichte Division and one Panzer Division, I think it was the 10th which only had one Panzer Regiment and not two, unlike the other five. So I, it's not perfect on spot, but it mainly right. So he assumed 250 tanks for each of those and 160 and he had 160 were in reality and he assumed one too much. But still the numbers are, let's say, okay-ish. Now the next source we take a look at is the war journal and this article is about the German army in May 1942 and the title is The Man We Are Up Against. And it's written by a senior officer who was in contact with the German army pre-war. And it's very interesting because it's a almost completely historical look at the situation. Now at first they look at Frederick the Great, on which I did a video. And it's very interesting to notice the major focus on drill, discipline, the innovations, but also this unscrupulous att uh, attempt on warfare and that it led the country both exhausted but also inspired. And then he said that after this genius died, there was a decay after Frederick. And then Napoleon came in and this led to the liberation wars in 1813 to 1814. And after that, it came to a decline again but then Bismarck and Moltke came around, Bismarck the Chancellor and Moltke the General, the reformer, and this led to the 1866 war against Austria and to 1870-71 against the Franco-Prussian war. And you know the high education standards. And at this time, the German army did not fall in disrepair, but was at its most readiness in 1914. Very efficient at this point, they consider it. 
And then they note that yet the army was then in 1918 decisively beaten in the field. Which is quite interesting to other aspects because usually other sources noted that the German army broke or Germany broke down in 1918 and that they assumed again it would happen. But it was not stated in others from what I read that is it decisively beaten in the field of battle. They basically leave out Versailles, they just note the 100,000 man army and then they look at Hitler. And here's the thing, they look at the combined stuff, they look at the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, the high command of the Wehrmacht, and they assume that this is a combined stuff of air force, army and navy. Which it was in name, but actually it didn't function this way. So they got this wrong, but which is not particularly a main issue because yeah, from the naming in the organization, one would assume it was a, a combined stuff, but it wasn't. Now, if the, the note here, there's a lot of pre-military training and the, the labor service, which the Reichsarbeitsdienst, which they also note during the war, it was mainly canceled. Then they speak of the total nazification, and they note it's very interesting that due to the Hitler Youth and the training before, that the two-year military service actually might be seen as a promotion because they already so trained in discipline and professionalization before they joined the armed forces. Very interesting aspect, but they also know that the Germans are obedient, but not blindly obedient. And that they are basically, they don't, they don't note nitpicking, but they note that every error is noticed and corrected. So that this focus is there, this nitpicking aspect. And if you look at my comment section, I think this is still rather valid with every error noticed and corrected. Then they also note training, that the training is hard and realistic and there were a lot of losses in the last pre-war maneuver. And also very well on that they're trained for the offensive, something I noted in why the Wehrmacht was so effective. And that their orders are short and on point and quite different to that of the British Army. So they note, okay, if they have an order for a core or something, it's, it's rather short, it's a few lines, not more. And the Germans are well known for this. So they also note the, the strong drill, but also a lot of latitude. So, and that there are clear defined limits, yet outside of these limits, or inside of these limits better, there's a lot of initiative given. So what they're basically speaking about here is describing the mission tactics, the auftrags tactic. That a soldier gets a certain mission, and he must achieve this mission, but how is he achieving it is up to him. So that he uses his initiative and his own imagination and capabilities to achieve this. And sometimes he can also break certain rules if it serves for achieving the mission. And they also did really discuss the Schwerpunkt, the main point of effort, that it's very important for the Germans to set a certain Schwerpunkt for an offensive. And the quote, I think, the general stuff was something with that uh, an offensive action without a Schwerpunkt is like a man without a character. So, very interesting points, and most of them I think are quite on point from what I know. So I hope you have now a better understanding what the British thought about the Germans in the Second World War and the Wehrmacht. So, for most part, on the German army side, the estimates were quite reasonable and well done. For the Luftwaffe side, they were quite off and for the Navy they were not as good as for the Army from what I read so far, but quite accurate as well. Of course for the Navy I read far fewer. So, well. My big thank you here to my Oberst Andrew who inspired this question and also a big thank you to all my Patreon. Thank you for watching and see you next time.